Um, he started this uh, many years ago and it's just an incredible inspiration to all of us. Derek, you have anything you want to say? Uh, well, Renzo, just again, just Ish and everybody else, you know, thank you guys for being here. And Renzo, just thank you for sharing your experience with us. We're just like sponges and we're just here to just soak in, soak up whatever you can give us. <laughs> okay, okay. All right, what I'll do is I'll introduce Ranzo. Please do. What's going on, fellas? I want to introduce you to Ranzo. He's a black father. He's a husband. Uh, um, he has this phenomenal YouTube uh, uh, page uh, called The Black Experience in Japan. And it's a great show. And what it is, is he, he shares his story living in Japan, J Japan as well as all uh, black people that lives in Asia and give us this perspective, the black experience in, in the in Asia countries. Cause I think that's important because we often get the perspective of the black life in America, but we don't get it abroad. So having Renzo on to give us that perspective, I think it's gonna be an awesome conversation. Renzo, it's all you brother. Okay. All right, so all right, so I'm looking, I'm looking at the audience right now, and I'm like, well, it seems like you guys might be a little bit more versed at being fathers than I am, right? I became a father like six years ago, um, almost seven, going on seven. My daughter's going to be seven in December this year. Um, but I guess a little bit of backstory of just my experience with, I guess, fatherhood. Um, not necessarily me being the father, but my father being my father. Um, so I grew up in Jamaica, right? Um, and uh, my father left Jamaica for America. He's been there since. He lives in New York even now. Um, when I was one, right? So when I just came out, pretty much um, him and my mother, I guess, had some type of fallen out. And he left and went overseas. Um, so for the vast majority of my life, my father uh, um, had been physically absent. Um, I think it's, it's something that sound, is all too familiar for people within the Caribbean, in North America. Uh, mostly, I think, I think this sort of pandemic um, plagues Black people for some reason more than any other racial group, I believe. Um, so I, I, it's strange because I had this sort of admiration for my father, even in his like, uh, absence. He wasn't there, but I was drawn to my father. So whenever he would come to Jamaica, which was about... I think five times over the course of my life, maybe five, maybe less, um, before I moved to Canada when I was 18. Um, so you know, five times from um, one uh, to 18. I think the last time was when I was maybe 15, 14, something like that. And I always like really, really admired my dad, but he wasn't there physically. Um, uh, financially as well, I think he wasn't really there, even though like you know he had more resources because he was overseas. And of course, if you think about cur currency conversion, the Jamaican currency is not as strong as USD. Even today, it's one forty plus uh, JMD to one USD, right? So um, he wasn't really supportive in that capacity. So my mom had to like shoulder two jobs. Um, the typical story. It's not unlike any story that you've heard before. Um, I was um, a pretty studious student. I was pretty studious, but I was also rebellious as well. Um, I guess because my my father wasn't there, um, myself and my brothers were a handful for my mom because, hey, like you know, we're men or little boys or whatever. And she tried to be as strict as she possibly could, but a mother cannot father a child. It's impossible. Uh, each parent, as we know, you know, were given a certain set of tools for a certain job, right? So if I'm a carpenter, I have my tools to be a carpenter. You can't expect a mechanic to be a carpenter. They're not equipped with that knowledge, right? And I, I believe God gave the mother something to contribute to the child and the father as well. And of course, we live in a society now where it's single motherhood, right? It's, it's cool that the mother, some mothers remain, right? It's good. But at the same time, I think we need to realize that there is a sort of void that's left that cannot be filled by Anyone else but the father. A father's role should be filled by a father. And I lack that growing up in my life. My dad wasn't there. My mom tried her best. Of course, she had two jobs, right? She she tells a story you now that we're growing about how she, you know, sacrificed this and sacrificed opportunity to further her education to make sure that me and my brother had food and books for school and all these things. And um uh, yeah, it was uh it was rough, but I don't know why I was drawn to my dad. Like he never really did much more than conch contributed his permatazoa that brought me into the world um, at that time. Uh, but when he became a Christian, he started to ch change a little bit in terms of 
trying to give me and my brothers advice, right? Trying to steer us into the right in the right direction that he never walked himself. Um, so that was when he was more uh, present in terms of advice, but not well uh, financially when he was able to, right? Because you know we all have like peaks and valleys. Um, so that was when there was a shift. Um, but there was this intense anger, I guess, within me that maybe manifested itself in other ways um and i think um because i used to fight a lot like i was like i had a serious anger problem uh and i think maybe my father not being there contributed to that i really think it did um maybe that was my way of venting um so cause, because whenever i would come to jamaica even though i never really knew him per se in being there physically um he uh when he came, we were very disciplined. Me and my, the brother that followed me, I'm the first one. He, um, like, we were just so disciplined. We would listen to him. He said one word and we're just like, you know, hi, hi. You know, we're just, they're like soldiers. Um, when my mother would say something, it's like, okay, whatever. You know, we kind of just, you know, we, we would listen, but we still try to like do whatever we wanted, you know? Um, but there was this level of respect. And I think it comes naturally, I guess. And I think maybe due to maybe society or just experience, that sort of respect and reverence erodes, right? I'm not sure how it works, but it seems like that happens. But I think there's this natural thing for children to gravitate to their father with that level of respect and reverence. Um, so yeah, so yeah, anger problem. Uh, when I actually met up with him in New York for the first time, this was, when was this? this I don't know, it was a while back. Uh, maybe, who? Oh, not, not even too long ago, actually. That was... 2013 maybe i think 2013 um yeah i it, i think it all came out um it all it, it all came to the surface at that point um where this conversation or that turned into an argument in the house and um it's almost like i reached a point where it's almost like i wanted to almost like you know like get to a physical level with my father because i was so mad um and we went for a drive you know we went for a drive i, don't, I think we went to i don't know where we went we drove somewhere in queens or whatever and we kind of just sat there in the car and had like a conversation and sort of like unpacked what transpired i guess behind the scenes to give me another perspective i guess um and i think that sort of like brought a level of uh, reconciliation between my father and i um and since then now we talk like usually like we're, we're kind of like the same in, in the sense of most of the talents that he has i were passed down to me like you know all the things that he was you know was good at um it seems like i've brought it to maybe another level like he probably brought it to like this level and i've, I've actually like i sort of like matriculated or surpassed where he left it um so we have a lot in common so now we have like long conversations like two hours on the phone um whatsapp facetime whatever um and now he and my mom has also reconciled uh she yeah so long story i have even other sisters in in um new york as well with from a different lady um and my mom pretty much stuck it out for wow she stuck it out for maybe what maybe 15 years actually uh, uh made her way to new york and uh they reconciled and they've been together since that time up until this point which is which has been like a while actually like almost two decades now um so she she's something else right as much as you know she she's something else that's all i can say and i think that's why kids sometimes look up to their mom in a sense because they were there and it might be this sort of like maternal instinct i think um but uh but anyways um that was my experience with fathers and black experience in japan is a sort of byproduct of my experience growing up why because my father wasn't there for a period of time so i sought role models i've always been the type of person that you know i read books and i try to like get information from other people right just to learn and and, and even though i'm in jamaica the the most popular media was from came out of hollywood all the movies came from hollywood right so you guys know hollywood is the most powerful media force in the in the world so whatever is exported right um other countries eat it up so that's sort of like a negative stereotype of black people was made manifest in the media um uh, sh strong even in a country jamaica the the motto of jamaica is out of many one people so you would see someone that is caucasian that speaks patwa like this right like jamaican patwa right so they would sound just like a jamaican right and look white as chalk 
right? And then you'd have an Indian person, same thing, a Chinese person, same thing, you name it. So Jamaica is a sort of like amalgam, well, maybe not an amalgam, but it's a, it's definitely um, a very diverse um, place, like a melting pot, so to speak. Uh, so, however, despite that, we consumed a lot of media from America. So that sort of like a negative stereotype, I saw it over and over again, over and over again. And I was, I was like, man, like, I need to see positive representation. Is there anyone that's, you know, that like, can we see more black people in the roles that are positive? Like, it was a problem for, for me for a very, very long time. And um, it, it, I guess I kind of gave birth to BEJ uh, as a way to um, sort of like, I guess, um, give voice, I guess, to the thoughts in my head, to my desires. Um, to bring it out in a sort of manifestation. Um, and I guess that was intensified because in Japan, there's almost no black presence whatsoever, maybe 0 0.02, right? That's a guesstimation. Um, and so I think being in Japan, I'm like, man, okay, wow. Like, okay, media is so powerful because the perception of black people in Japan was solely contributed through media, okay? So a person would see you as a black person. They're not seeing you. Right. You have this thing that they call in psychology trigger feature. Right. So someone like in the in the in nature, a bird would see a bird with a certain feather or a predator might see a prey with a certain characteristic. And that triggers something and causes something to happen. And I think as black people, our skin for many people is a trigger feature. So the moment someone sees you as a black person, immediately they go into even beyond their sub, their conscious mind. It's, it's almost immediate, almost unconscious. They respond a certain way, walking down the street. A Japanese person might see me, they're walking down. I'm a cool guy, I'm good. As long as, you know, like, you don't do me anything, I'm cool, right? And I, now I think I'm even more mature beyond that point where even if you aggravate me, it takes me a while to, to get kind of irritated. Uh, so a person might see me, for instance, and then they, because I'm black, that's all they know. They don't know my name, they don't know what I do, they don't know anything about me whatsoever, that I'm a nice guy, but they see me and then immediately they cross the street. Trigger feature. The representation of a black person what have i seen in movies what have i seen in media what do i what have i heard about black people and that's all they see they don't see ranzo they never introduced themselves they never said you know Konchua or hi whatever nothing black skin immediately triggers something in their mind and they respond to that so people don't see you they don't know you in japan they see a black person mostly not a lot of like maybe 80 percent of the populace in japan they see your skin now that's the reality so what I wanted to do wanted to do was to combat that imagery. How can I show black people as we are? Not a stereotype, right? Not to sort of over embellish our positive attributes, but to show us as we are, as we are, as human beings like anyone else, same experiences. We all have family, well, most of us have families, right? We're trying to be good fathers, good wives, good mothers, you know, you know, good kids, students, whatever, we're trying to provide for our families. The same exact thing, the human experience is universal. <laughs> There's no difference, really. <laughs> we make it we make it different or, or challenge, more challenging for other people. So some people make it challenging for Black people because of whatever reason and stuff like that, right? So that was my goal, to put something out there so people can see people that are doing what they want to do. And a byproduct of that work is for people who aren't Black to actually, I guess, have an environment where they can just watch something, right? They won't feel like, oh snap, I'm putting myself in a position now to engage with this black person and might say something that might make them feel uncomfortable or whatever. They can watch it through the screen, take from it what you will, but you're seeing someone as they are. Not what you heard, not what you've seen in fictitious media, but someone as they are. And I think that was a way of me kind of like trying to push role models out there or representatives of or representation of people that look like me that might inspire other people and i guess a byproduct a byproduct of that work is that a lot of people have actually um you know like left for asia because they saw that oh son they did it so i can do it too um so i think so my father being absent create created a void that was filled um not entirely um but i guess the thing that was birthed out of that experience kind of what became BEJ and which I think has, has done a lot of good stuff since we started what in 2017. Um, my my journey 
Um, so it's important. So of course, representation is important. Um, black fathers are extremely important. I'm super passionate about this, right? Like for instance, like we understand that most of the crime in, in a lot of societies are committed by kids that grew up without a father. There's something, as I said, I'm not saying the father is more special or whatever, but definitely we have a lot more authority, I think. We, fathers are very, very powerful. And when you remove that foundation from a family, it's problematic. It's, I, I lived it. I lived it. I grew up in a, in a community in Jamaica that we call an inner city community. Like you'd call it, I don't know, hood or the, the ghetto or whatever. Like I, I grew up in that type of environment. And most of the kids that were there, not all, because some had their fathers, but their fathers were, I guess, sort of like ex estranged, you know, kind of, or, you know, uh, had some other woman somewhere in another parish or something. And they grew up and, you know, even some people with good fathers still like end up ended up been doing criminal activity but a lot of the crime as you guys i'm pretty sure you know um are contributed by you know uh, children of absent fathers right so uh pff, daughters have a daughter right promiscuity father not being there the the rate of that increases exponentially uh, so we're extremely important and i have a daughter so i'm trying my best to be that you know the person that I guess my father wasn't in my early um, years, earlier years. And uh, so I'm trying to, to be that person, but I don't always get it right. I feel like there's so much, um, so it, being a parent is so important. I don't even think the, the modern media understands how important it is, a mother and a father. I'm not talking about just a mother, not even just a father, but a mother and a father, right? And we have this sort of lopsided existence where it's like all mothers and fathers are almost non-existent. And it's so crazy to me that the parent that has so much power over the future of a child and, just, and, and society at large is the one that um, <laughs> has been ostracized, um, has, always, um, has almost been made obsolete and we understand this, but a lot of people seem not to understand this. I was talking to my, my own mother um, maybe a few months ago, and she was almost arguing that a mother is more important than a father. I'm just like, hold up. I'm like, hold up for a second. I'm like, hold up. My mother has this mind. I'm like, wait, I had to try to dismantle it as much as I could because she's very stubborn. Okay. So, so I, I tried, I attempted to, to try to like, you know, bring it down a little bit to, to a more equal um, footing and standing. Um, so I think we have a um, mammoth of a task in terms of changing the perception of fathers, um, you know, in the Western Hemisphere mostly, because I think in the in the East, it might be a little bit better. Um, in Japan, being a father here, I guess one of the problems is that my daughter is Black, right? She, my, her mom is Black, I'm Black, so my daughter is Black. Even though she attends a Japanese school, right, speaks Japanese, um, she's not 100% fluent yet, but she's maybe like 85% to like the early, like, you know, low 90s um, in terms of like comprehension, and being able to speak right uh so she's in that environment where she is you know black and um if she don't have that uh that sort of like reinforcement of her identity then it might become problematic i've interviewed quite a few people and even my most recent interview were from uh were with two sisters who grew up in japan black right and they had this identity crisis and it was a father that sort of like gave the one of the daughters her roots and caused her to understand that, you know, she's black and there's strength, you know, in her ancestry and all these things. And that gave her a sort of confidence. And uh, she had a pretty good experience because despite what happened, ex like externally, internally, she was um, fortified, she was strong, she was firm. And I think that's a challenge for, for black fathers in Japan, because now your daughter is in school for maybe most of the time um, in a day, right? Uh, you know, she come, she come home, you spend some time, she go to safe school again, five days per week. And you have the challenge of trying to, you know, instill that thing in her that to make her feel centered. Um, Renzo. Yeah. So, so Renzo, you, you shared a lot with us. And <laughs> if just for a moment, I just wanted some of the brothers maybe to chime in and see how they resonate with your story. Um, I just want to also mention to you that that was pretty much the catalyst that motivated um, Derek to start the Real Dads Club, to change the narrative of fathers. You know, that mm -hmm. when you talk of, of Black men, Black fathers, they're not all 
dead beaters. They're not, not always running around. They care for their children. They want to, they're there to support their children. They care. And, and Derek is very, that's his inspiration. And that's the inspiration of this organization to change the narrative. And we're here to support each other. But what I'm hearing from the conversation here and what you shared with us is the importance of a dad being in his child's life and the repercussions. And that, and I think when we have this discussion, that's important because that motivates us to say, yeah, let's keep doing what we're doing. Let's support each other. Let's be the best dads. How can we support dads? So I don't know if anyone on the call wants to resonate um, how, if they want to share, if anything they heard from Ranzo, they could resonate with just to support the dialogue of the conversation. Um, yes, Tyrone. I, uh, thank you, Lorenzo. I, I um, I appreciate the, the introduction, especially uh, how you introduced your dad initially and then brought it back to how he's important. Um, I had met a, a, an author a few years ago and he told me about um, a slang, not only in Japan, but in the Asian communities where the black children resulting from Vietnam, they were called daddy bye-bye. Um, whatever in that language. And I didn't understand what it meant, but it meant the, the Vietnam vets that left their children there, instead of calling them the N-word, it was called daddy bye-bye um, because their daddy wasn't there. And, you know, I just applaud you for standing up as a good dad in a, in a community where there is such a, um, a horrific amount of racism. And um, I don't know how it's being solved but just one dad at a time standing up with his children is an honorable deed. So thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Anyone else? Thanks, Tyrone. Um, and I would say, Renzo, can you talk about some of the challenges you're facing? I mean, you're talking about your child, you said six, right? And you're in a different country with a different culture. So what are some of those challenges and how are you dealing with those challenges? Okay, um, well, challenges. Okay, um, I think, hmm. okay, as a father, right, you, you're concerned more about safety, the safety of your child, especially, you know, a girl, right? So um, I think that's something that is in my mind every now and again. And, uh, you know, I think about like how I would respond, uh, you know, God forbid if anything should, you know, transpire that is unfavorable. Um, so, so that, I think that's one challenge where because, yeah, the, the kids in Japan, for the most part, they walk to school by themselves, um, usually sometimes in groups, um, and they would walk, well, well, usually you live within, the school is within your community, pretty much, right, so it's not that far, maybe like 10 to 15 minutes, um, a 10 to 15 minute walk, right, so sometimes I'm concerned about that, uh, I, I think about, like, if something happens in school with another kid, like, how can I handle that, you understand, because, um, I would be angry, of course, right? And, and I would just be like, you know what? Um, yeah, I'd be a little bit emotional about that. And I think the way that I would wanna deal with it would not be the way that I should deal with it. Um, so, um, so that's one thing in my mind, I think about it. But one thing that I've seen with my daughter, like she's like, I shared this story before, she's miles ahead of like, just, I don't know, a six year old, six year old child. Cause she wrote a letter in Japanese to her teacher because there were, a few, a group of kids, maybe like what? I think she listed all the names to so maybe like four to six kids who said things to her, you know, and stuff like that. And she wrote a letter to the teacher, of course, in Japanese, telling the teacher to talk to these kids because, you know, they're doing this and that. And I'm like, snap, she actually had the, I don't even know what to call it. <laughs> I'm at a loss for words that she presented that to, to the teacher and the teacher actually, Japanese teacher called the, the kids to the side, spoke to them, spoke to the entire class. And she said, since that, like they haven't said anything. So I think the work that we do at the house is really equipping her to be able to, even in our uh, absence, to take the initiative and communicate or, or try to problem solve in her own unique way. Because I'm telling her, if they do this, do that. You know, or say this, say that. You know, I'm, I'm trying to tell her that, but she literally, she sat down. We never even initiated this letter. She just sat in her room one night and she came and she just showed her mom. Well, lies, her mom said she never wanted to show the letter. She started writing it and she was like, no, she don't want to share, show her the letter, but she's like, let me see it. She read it and she's like, oh snap, look at this. And that's how that started, right? So, but my concern is how can I keep my daughter safe 
in a country where she looks so different, she stands out. So when she's walking to school, she's the only black child in this group of like CF of uh, CF Japanese people. So you might you know like as a black person in Japan, you stand you cannot hide. You you cannot hide at all. Okay, just forget about hiding. Um, so she's walking on the street. When you look, you see her. Like you know, you can't miss her. So I I wonder about like how can I keep her safe, right? So I believe in prayer. Like I'm a Christian, so I pray. So I'm like God, please. When I'm not there, keep her safe. Right, like when I'm there, keep her safe still. But when I'm not there, please keep her like doubly safe, right? Because it's like, what can you really do um, when they're at school and you're not there unless someone calls you, right? Sometimes I try to pick her up as much like drive to school and pick her up or uh, or um, bring her home in the car versus just walking because I'm like, if something should happen, God forbid. So that's I think that's one of the major things: how to keep my daughter safe um, in a culture where she stands out, right? So there's more attention um you know that's coming her way so that's a big one um i think thanks Randall. um kendrick and then puma um if, if i could ask what what was the catalyst for you going to japan um okay it, it's one of those uh we call it the cliche move i'm like an artistic guy um so i've always been fascinated with like anime animation from I'm younger uh from when i was younger so like you know i used to draw these things so anime was my uh, the sort of soft power that uh, Japan exercised over me. And um, so I studied Japanese a little bit before leaving Jamaica for about eight months. Um, and then I left uh, Jamaica and went to Canada. And then I had this, I was working at a part-time job at this um, at this school. And the one of the managers, literally, this is how it happened. I'm just sh sharing, this is how it happened. I wanted to go to Japan from a long time ago, right? From I left high school, but I never um, made my way to Japan. I made my way to Canada instead. So I did language school, went to Canada and then over a decade plus past. And then I had a chance conversation at this job I had. And uh, the, the lady just said, oh, I went to Japan um, on this program. We just started talking about Japan randomly, one day randomly. And she's like, oh, I went on this program to Japan. You know, I spent two years. I'm like, oh, snap. I wanted to go to Japan, you know, like. And she's like, yeah, you should try this program. And it just happened that that program was two weeks. Um, the deadline, I think the, the application period was eight months. And we had the conversation two weeks before the deadline went home spoke to my wife she's like hey i'm down why not she's a trained teacher i'm like okay let's just apply to it and then we came to japan that was pretty much it so i moved my family i had a part-time job and i also had a, a small business on the side and then uh, i left pretty much everything <laughs> and we came to japan just for the sake of adventure we wanted to experience something different that's kind of like the way we are right okay so that's how we live mm -hmm. so so i kind of i have a, a second question and i have a follow-up but i'll ask it after puma goes um, did you have to expatriate to leave uh, Jamaica? Like um, well, I'm I'm a legal um, Canadian like resident, okay. so yeah. I yeah. So it's yeah. So, this so is you're so, but because Jamaica doesn't do dual citizenship, so you no 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 yes you can, no 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 definitely oh. you can have yes you can have like an American passport, a Canadian passport, a Jamaican passport. Yeah, Japan is the one that does not allow dual citizenship. Yeah. Okay. So you're not, a, so you are, you're in Japan on a visa? Uh, yes, a resident visa. Okay. All right. A, a long-term resident visa. Okay. Not, a, not a citizen. I don't think I'll do that because I need to keep my citizenship for elsewhere. Gotcha. Okay. So like I said, I have a follow-up question, but I'll ask it later on because I, 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 it's okay. an aspect that I'd like to pose to you in the, the, I don't know if it's the universality of this experience, but also just mm -hmm. something that I think would prompt some additional thought as you process this, like to kind of add to your perspective uh, of your experience, because that's that's what I'm getting from you, like a broadening of my perspective of my experience. But go ahead, Puma. Okay. Cool. Renzo, thanks for your time, brother. Um, you asked one of the questions already. I was wondering why Japan, but it was the same question um, um, Mr. Wonderful had. So the second question, I, two things I want to say. I thought it was, <clears throat> it's amazing that even though your father wasn't in your life, you still admire your father, which is a natural thing. You know, that's natural. And it's just proof that we are important, like you said. I think one thing with children is that mine, like my father, my mother. So the only one father. So I think that we always want our father. So as fathers, we got to remember that our kids want us in their life, no matter what the mother says. Well, I always say we gotta fight to be in our kids' life, no matter what the mother is telling them. If you don't fight for your kids, they're gonna bleed their mother. So, um, but that's one thing. I wanna know this though. In America, we're taught 
been brainwashed over the years. It's the greatest country in the world, blah, blah, blah. What is your experience in Japan as far as a country? I know there's no black, no black people there, right? So she's the only black child in the school. 0.002 people black in, in um, the country. What is your experience of the country? Like, what is the economy? Can you own your own business? It's like America, land of free, home of the brave, capitalism. So in Japan, so yeah. So what? So in Japan, what is it like? Do do they do they promote freedom and do your own thing, get your own money? What is it like for you in Japan? Okay, so I guess I could just talk about just the the Japanese psyche or approach when it comes on to entrepreneurship, because uh, I right. consider myself an entrepreneur. I've been doing yeah. my own thing for a while. Um, uh, I read this this thing about the guy that started SoftBank. I'm not sure if you guys know what SoftBank is, but it's one of the, the biggest telecommunications company in Japan. Uh, and uh, when he started, he's actually Korean. When he started the company, entrepreneurship was frowned upon. So in Japan, it's more so about actually uh, getting into a company, like let's say, for argument's sake, let's just say IBM or let's just say Sony. Let's say Sony, for instance, a Japanese company. Sony, right? And you work at Sony until you retire, that's it. All right? So it's all about planting your roots in one company, remaining loyal until the end of your days. That's it, right? So anyone that wants to walk a separate path and become an entrepreneur is problematic. People, it's frowned upon, right? It's not something that people would encourage and say, oh, go and start this company. So that's the general mindset of Japan. And I think maybe that's one of the reasons why the economy has been stagnant for over two decades because they don't want, uh, they don't, they're not, I guess they innovated back in the day, but for some reason now they're not as innovative. For some reason, I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, but as a foreigner in Japan, a black person, there aren't many, as many hurdles as maybe in America, for instance, or even well, Canada. There's still some racism there because I, I believe I face some, but it's a little bit milder than in America, right? Uh, but in Japan, if you can speak the language, even if you can't, if you can find a niche within the country, you can succeed, right? So. Uh, especially if you're if you can speak the language i know a lot of black people if you check my channel who are doing amazing things in japan because there's not this sort of like some people have it but not everyone there's not this sort of like invisible wall where people are like you cannot do this thing because you're black right it seems like you have more of an opportunity to to uh express yourself and explore ideas um i think japan itself also like the environment of this country allows you to think freely there's not you're not okay it's almost like energy that you would expel or expend to um to defend yourself is being redirected toward creative creative thinking right so instead of like okay i gotta like protect myself from all these racist people and all these people who are trying to bring me down it's like that is redirected to what can i create for myself that can you know help myself and my family and contribute to the society so i think japan is a place where you can actually do that because it's not uh, there they exist but not as many because I, I've interviewed a lot of Americans and they say, look, they can do this, they can do that. In America, it might not be the case because of uh, maybe lack of access to capital or this or whatever other reason. But in Japan, they, they've told me that most of the barriers that they face don't exist, but there are still some, but a lot less than the, than the barriers which exist in America, for instance, right? So I know people with restaurants, I know people with schools, I know people with businesses, people are doing um, really well. Uh, in Japan and Japanese people support them as well. So I think that it's a, yeah, so that's sort of like the environment in Japan. And also we come into the country with a foreigner perspective. So we see opportunities where the, the native don't see it because we come with a different perspective from the Western world and they might not be able to, they might be blinded to or blind to a certain opportunity, but we see it because we're coming with our experience and expertise and we create something that they never knew that was possible. Randall, that's, you, did that answer your question, Pullman? Yeah, it really did. Can I say one more thing? Please. Please. Um, mm -hmm. please. Okay, now, as a father, with your daughter going through what she's going through now, is there any level of guilt there? Any thoughts of leaving? Like, your daughter got to go through that? Like, as a father, having your kids go through this now, how do you feel about that? Do you want to leave or you want to let her fight it out? What do you think the next 12, 15 years before your kids? You ever think about leaving for that reason? Um, that's my last question. The thing, with, um, the thing is, um, the reason why, like I said, when I was when I was in Canada, I'm gonna keep it short. I know I'm like I'm very verbose. Forgive me. Um, my my thing is, I'm always willing to leave somewhere at any time if the, the need arises. I consider myself a global citizen, 
right? The world is pretty much my country, let's let's say. So if I want to go somewhere else, I have the resources to go, I'm going to go. So if my daughter, if you reach a level where my daughter is facing some next level racism, I'm not going to let her endure that. My wife is an amazing teacher, so that's why my daughter is English speaking and writing above her, her age. So even if she don't go to school, my wife can homeschool my daughter and she'll be just or or even more advanced than the other child, children, right? So uh, so in my mind, I'm just like, okay, like whatever I need to do to protect, protect her, I will. It's not at a level at all where she's like, oh, I don't want to go to school. Like she, if I say today, oh, sorry, we gotta, we, I can't, um, you know, you can't go to school today, today because she's mad, okay? She wants to go. So it's not to the place where she's like, I don't want to go to school, daddy, no. If that's the case, then we'll, we'll do what we need thank, to do. Thank you. So, Sorrento, thank, thanks so much. I mean, you're definitely exposing us to great information. Um, like I mentioned before, one of my mentees, Alex, is on the line. And Renzo, if you don't mind, I'd just like him to chime in a little bit of his, because I can see him nodding his head as you're talking. So, um, Alex, can you just chime in if you don't mind? Hi. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, first off, uh, my name is Alex Rivera. I have been living out here in Japan for about six years in Tokyo. Um, I do know Renzo. I've you know, I've been a fan of his channel ever since he started it, but I actually know his wife uh, much better because uh, we worked through the same program. Um, we just had a really great uh, friendship. Um, it was actually through her that I have my current day job. Uh, so I uh, know of Ranzo and I know his daughter very, very well because I, you know, I see her at least once a week or, or once every two weeks. Um, the girl is absolutely extremely bright. It, just as Renzo said, if, you know, she needs to be taken out of school, um, she'll be fine. This is a girl of, that's like six years old who can read at a fourth grade, uh, level, um, always in books, uh, very smart, very confident in herself. Um, just amazing kid, uh, to explain a little bit more about, uh, starting a business, uh, being able to. Uh, be able to be a creator. I myself am a creator uh, for about six months uh, before between maybe November and uh, April. Uh, I decided that um, there was a job that I was working. I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to quit this job and go out uh, on my own, do my own business as an artist. Uh, so for the past uh, two and a half years, um, I've been drawing every day and posting on uh, about my life in Japan on online on Instagram, uh, becoming a professional artist and decided that, you know what, I can just uh, make art and sell it to people uh, and do commission work. Uh, and that's been absolutely great. It's been fantastic. Japan is really a country where if you have a particular hobby, or if you have something that you are particularly passionate about, there is a community to find it, whatever it is. If it's underwater basket weaving, there is a community and a group there. It may not exactly be in your location um, if you live out in just the super rural area of Japan, but there is a, uh, a group, a platform for that. That is the kind of way that Japanese people are able to relieve stress. That's what they do on their weekends or their days off is they're very invested in hobbies. And that's something that is kind of instilled in them from the time that they are in uh, elementary school and middle school. Club activities is just a really big thing. So uh, as an artist, uh, it was fantastic to be able to work on my own. However, with visa situation, uh, it's very, very difficult for you to get a, uh, a self-sponsorship visa or an entrepreneur visa without at least, oh, uh, like $50,000. So from that point on, I had to kind of figure out, well, uh, I need someone else to kind of uh, be able to sponsor my visa. So I'll, I guess I'll probably just get a day job. Um, and from there, I went back into being an English teacher. Uh, I have been an English teacher for about six years or so. Um, I think another point that you guys uh, tried to mention was just the individuality of, of it all. Um, as Ranzo said, yes, once you are uh, hired by a Japanese company, you are 
uh, an employee for life. So you don't really have that uh, insecurity of, okay, well, you know, if I do this, then I'll be fired or, you know, the company will just drop me. It's very much like the, uh, a little bit after the industrial revolution in the United States where, you know, you work a good job, you work nine to five. Here, the uh, overtime culture is a bit different. So uh, you're definitely working way more than just nine to five. But uh, that sense of security, that sense of, uh, it's almost a Confucius style of thinking, whereas you are part of the whole. You, you are part of the machine, you are the little cog in the wheel, but your contribution to society is worth a lot more than your individuality. And that's where those, the Western style clashes with the Eastern style. Um, the last thing that I'll, that I'll probably say is uh, how is Black culture kind of viewed here? And it really depends on each uh, person that you ask. So if you watch Renzo's videos, you'll see different, um, different people from the diaspora, whether they are from uh, the United States or they are born here, they're, they're like half Japanese or you know, they're from uh, Africa, where they are actually from a different part of the world. Each person has a different idea of how they've been treated. My uh, perspective, per se, here in Tokyo, um, especially being an American, being from New York City, uh, you know, I've, I'm automatically listed as cool, as this person that people want to get to know. And I think that's a privilege that I had absolutely no power over but it's a really great advantage. Now, there are also other opportunities or other instances where there is racism. Yes, absolutely. Um, or times where you sit down on a, on a train and uh, you know, somebody that doesn't really wanna sit next to you, so they'll, they'll move away. You know, that happens a lot more during, there's a lot more fear towards foreigners here. Um, I don't necessarily feel like it's just because I'm, uh, you know, I'm black and Hispanic but it has to do more with the idea that foreigners are just really scary. I think Ranzo put it in a really good way that like, if you are black, you are, you definitely stand out in a crowd. Japan has, uh, I think it's like 98% of the population is Japanese. The other 1.9% is uh, other uh, Asian ethnicities, whether it's Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, Filip Filipino, uh, Thai. Uh, and then the 0.2% is like the other foreigners from Western countries. And even in that smaller uh, group, you have African Americans. So when, uh, you know, when another African American sees another African American, or just another person from the diaspora, you know, uh, there is the, you know, silent nod, like, yeah, like, I see you. Uh, hello, how are you doing? We may not actually talk to each other, but it's very much the, you know, like, Wakanda forever, like type of thing, even though, you know, we're not, we're not really in the, uh, we're not like super happy to see each other, but it's like, I see you. I know that you're here. I understand your struggle. I understand your resolve here. Uh, and that's always great to see. Yeah. So that's, that's Thanks, all. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Alex. Alex. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Manzo, you want to respond? No, yeah, no, true, true, true. I'm just nodding my head. <laughs> we have some questions for you, um, Kenyatta and then Leon. Leo. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, I just want to thank uh, Ranzo and Alex for um, being on with us today. Um, I see it's about probably almost 9 a.m. over <laughs> where you guys are about. Um, but um, I'm going to ask something different. Um, and not in regards to fatherhood. Uh, you see, I'm a, I'm a big guy. I was up here eating. I was starving. <laughs> um, is there any good food? Um, you know, Renzo, a Jamaican restaurant, um, Alex, any Latin restaurants? Um, or are you just assimilated to the culture? You just eat what everybody else eat? Or have you found any good spots or, you know, to, to remind you? of home or the States or Canada? Yeah, um, that's one of a, a big struggle for me, actually. I was talking about this maybe like three days ago, like finding food that I'm used to, um, whether it's Jamaican food or American food, I'm just like, man, sometimes you feel for that, right? 
and uh it's hard to find even in tokyo you do have some spots you got soul food house where, where you can get soul food um you have some other like uh steak joints uh some barbecue joints but they're not soul food house is pretty good the other ones aren't that i've tried so far aren't as good as i'm used to in the west um jamaican restaurants uh there's i think there's only one surviving in tokyo how's big, how's big jerk guy. how's big jerk, big jerk. Oh, big jerk. Okay, yeah, that's good. That, uh, that's all the way in uh, Niigata and Gifu. So I seen like almost a countryside. Uh, okay. That's good. Good stuff. Good stuff. Yes. Right. We're scattered. Right. So it's hard to really. If if I feel for it, I can't drive like four hours. Right. It's like I'm like I gotta drive four hours to get like a real good jerk chicken. Right. So sometimes <laughs> I'm like, oh snap, I can't go that far. And you gotta eat some ramen or something. <laughs> you know. So uh, it's uh, that's the struggle. It's a big struggle for me personally, actually. uh for me um yeah as renzo said it, when you live in tokyo you have an infinite amount of uh other options when it comes to international cuisine um i myself like you know if i'm ever really feeling like oh man like i miss uh puerto rican food like i'll make it myself uh i make sure that i bring some of the spices uh and essential ingredients from home there are international supermarkets so you can get a couple different things but uh you know the tastes of you know certain certain cuisines are just not the same you know they're more adapted to japanese taste buds so uh you know i have a lot of people who complain to me that you know when they really like spicy food if they're from a country that really enjoys spicy food like you can't uh, you can't really find something that that really makes you sweat. Um, in terms of like New York City style food, there are like a couple of places that serve like really great pizza out here. Um, not the best pizza, but like, you know, when it really hits the spot, I'm like, all right, I'm gonna go there. Uh, and that's an awesome freedom to have. Uh, I never try to take that for granted. Uh, I know that if I lived out in like the middle of nowhere, it would be really, really difficult, especially um, just the number of options that you have in the supermarket too. Like uh, the culture shock, like, you know, for me, I, I was always really interested in Japanese culture. I've had a very long history of trying to get to Japan. One of the biggest things that I was afraid of was just the food because uh, before I moved to Japan, I was a really picky person. I did not like Japanese food before I moved out here. I was not a fish person at all. So I was really scared. I like, well, what do I eat when I move out here? Um, and uh, I wouldn't say that I am like the greatest fish person. You know, if I see a dish there, like I'll try it. Uh, I think it's really more of the, the like, if I taste the sea, it's like, nah, it's a no-go for me. But, uh, you know, I have been able to adapt and, and eat sushi. I have been able to uh, really enjoy Japanese food. There's a lot of Japanese food here that, uh, you know, I never thought that I would like or uh, never thought that I would try in New York. Um, a lot of, like, different styles and the way that they, they cook their vegetables here, the way that... Uh, the meat and fruit taste here is so much more different than it is uh, back home in the United States. And that's just because they don't really add so many like GMOs and, and pesticides in them. Uh, the flip side of that is that uh, food can cost, or at least groceries can cost a lot more and you have to go more frequently than you do to, in the United States. So for example, uh, and you really have to wait until a certain fruit or vegetable is in season. So for example, like strawberries could, you know, break your bank. You could uh, buy, you know, a little small box of strawberries for like, you know, six, $7, where you could probably get it for one or $2 back home in the United States. And they're, you know, really, really small strawberries. Uh, but the genuine taste of those things is just super different. Uh, so hopefully that, that answers your, your question about food and, and uh, the culture of food and adapting to those types of things. It does, Alex. Thank you. And thank you, Renzo. You're so I, I think um, Ken, Kenyatta will not be coming to Japan after that. Um, so, so, yeah, All right. So we have some um, questions. Um, Leo, um, Charles, and then Kendrick. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you guys for sharing your experiences. 
um, on Japan. It really changed my perspective, honestly, the way you guys are talking about it. I mean, for me, when I, you know, looked at Japan, it was more so on the negative. Um, side of things, um, even looking at videos and people living over there, even up to the inter uh, biracial Japanese citizens there, uh, they would talk about that bad experience that they would have. Um, I forgot the name they call them. I think it's Hafu. I'm not sure. Um, and so they would um, talk about, you know, their bad experiences. So to hear you guys, Black men, having this wonderful experience um, it, it really changed my perspective on it. Um, the other thing is, um, what about the uh, politics and how, like if you guys don't like how things are, okay, are you able to voice freely like you are here? Um, I'm not sure, because I know in Japan and other countries, uh, Korea, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of limited on speaking out on government. So how, how, how does that, work for you guys um well the thing is i i don't want to give a sort of like a lopsided argument um the back experience in japan is has its challenges right so um uh, someone described it as uh little paper cuts right it's not that bad when you get one but like they compound over time and then for instance like someone might you know walk away from you when they see you coming toward them and after a while of having that, you might get start getting irritated. You're like, come on now. Like, I've been here for this amount of time. Like, so it gets, it gets on your nerve after a while, right? So maybe, and sometimes you might sit down and someone might get up from beside you. Uh, a Japanese person said, it's because when they sit down in the train, they have this thing where they like, kind of like try to push their shoulders together to make more room for the person beside them. I got broad shoulders. I'm like, you were black people. I'm just like, I'm sorry, dude. Like, I, there's no way I can shrink my shoulders, right? But apparently they're saying there are certain things that unspoken rules that we don't know. So when we sit down, we might be too big, too this, too that. Cologne might be too strong or whatever. And they get up. So they try to find, that's how they justify getting up. But after a while you sit down and you're like, okay, like a dude, I've experienced where two people got up from beside me and went over to the next side and sat down. Like got up from beside me, like the corner seat that is the seat that everyone wants to sit in and went between two guys. I'm just like, okay, dude, like, I know I smell good because my colon is good, it's popping, right? So I'm like, there's no way <laughs> that you're smelling me, right? Dude got up. So sometimes those things, and I've had an experience with my daughter um, uh, when I was going to the train and coming through the ticket gate and I'm pushing her in the stroller and an Asian lady, maybe Japanese, maybe Chinese, I don't know, stood in the way. I tapped my car. So I was already halfway through. She stood in front of my daughter but she was sleeping, thank God she was, right? So she never saw the experience. The lady came and sat and stood right there and she's like, yo, like, bro. I had a, it was a, I had a really, really good, that day was a really good day for me in terms of the way I woke up. So it took me a while to actually reach the place where I'm like, cause I literally was just like, God, this lady is testing my faith today. I'm, I'm about to mow her over with the stroller, like, like I'm on the lawn just now. And I'm just like, you know what? I'm just like, you know what? I'm not gonna do that. They're gonna throw me in jail. So that's one thing too. Like if you do something as a foreigner, there, there's almost no recourse. Like even if you're not the perpetrator, you being the foreigner, there's almost no justice for you. That's another whole nother issue. I guess there's another way we could take this about even black fathers who have been pretty much been abolished from the life um, uh, of their, their kids. So they can't see them at all. You can't see your child. There's no such thing as shared custody in Japan. So if the mother, takes a child for whatever reason, you can't see the child, it's no longer your child. So that's another massive issue that I'm trying to, I'm thinking about actually um, doing something about, um, at least giving some publicity to, to this thing. Um, but anyway, so like, yeah, so the lady force passed me in that experience. And so you do have certain things, it, it's not all the time, but you have every now and again, maybe a few months, something happens and you know, and there might be this thing of, feeling like an outsider sometimes that might get to you like you know every now and again so it's not all it's not a utopia but it's a place that you can live if you can deal with that and um you know you can live and you can survive and you can you can thrive right so it's, but it's not a perfect society there are still things that we have to you know struggle with as well so i just wanted to say that to balance of the argument so it's, it doesn't seem like japan is this perfect place hendrick Kendrick, yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Do you want um, to put your, your hands up or is that from before? No, no, no. I put it back up. Okay. So I kind of, um, 
Um, hmm. I think I think what I was thinking may have been expounded on. Um, I just like I guess what I find interesting about the whole thing is, and I, and I guess the perspective that I want to give you. So just a little a quick backstory. Like I've I've been around the whole world like two and a half times, like literally. And I I was I, the the references that you made to the experience of of kind of not necessarily being. Like a lot of the countries that I went to, I think the last thing that they thought was that I was American, um, probably because of the folks that I was with. And I, w- I used to wonder whether that was a good or a bad thing. And I realized when I encountered Black folks who weren't from the States, that it was an insightful thing. It wasn't because I think the, the perspective that if I had something to share with you guys, um, I believe the young man, Alex, Alex, you're from the States. Are you from New York? Okay. Um, like being from the States, I think the biggest difference in this whole experience is that, so this is what I wanted to say that, that, that aside, because I think the point that I was going to would have made this a little heavy. I think the experience that you guys is, that you guys are having and that you're imparting is important because I don't think that Americans have any extensive desire to leave. Let me correct that. I don't think that black, whatever folks are calling themselves now, black, African-American and all that other stuff, every, we get a new name every few damn weeks. I don't think they have an extensive desire to leave the United States because of the fear or the concern that they're gonna have an experience worse than the one they're having here. And I think my question to Ranzo was what prompted him to be there was based on, so I'm familiar enough with Jamaica to have assumed until you uh, clarified what it was, was just an improvement in your life. Because I think that's why most people live, leave where they're from. You know, so honestly, when I encounter people of color, I'm gonna go with that. Here in the United States who look like me, who, talk about how great where they are from is, my first thought is always, why did you leave? Because from my perspective, having traveled as much, I probably think about leaving the United States every other week. The only thing that keeps me here is my mom and my family. And, and, and that's because I've been other places and understand that you at least have an opportunity to make a first impression. Where it's here in the United States, contrary to what people like to perpetuate, at the end of the day, we're black men. And when we're walking the streets, nobody's interviewing us, asking us where we went to college and how much education we got, or whatever the case may be. It's like, wow, you're one of those. I'm scared. I may need to harm you because I heard you harm everybody else. And so I, I say all of that to say that I hope that there's an expansion. I'm not familiar with what Alex does, but um, when I got the the intro for Ranzo's thing, I kind of looked at it. And I hope that you guys see the benefit in what you're communicating to a really broad community. And also, and this is the part that I was saying as far as the universality of it, I want you to understand that what you're imparting, there is a part of it that you, I'd like you to consider gaining some knowledge and Alex has it of what the American black man's experience is because it'll give you some some broadening uh, context in what you're conveying because I get what you're saying because I've had that experience but for people who haven't I think there are some things that you're leaving out that are like critical to communicating that like we we have yet to grasp the idea like I'm, I'm I'm a citizen of three countries now because after the, the diaspora, like the continent is just opening it up. Every one of them, every time one of them offers it, I'm, I'm on that list. And I see the benefit in that just simply because there's something very freeing about being able to leave somewhere that I know we legally can't because I, I'd be hard pressed to believe that a lot of brothers on here understand that we can't legally leave the United States. That's why I asked you about the expatriation. A lot of folks don't understand, as an American citizen, you can't just pick up and go to another country. That's a deal that the United States has with most of the countries on the planet. Like, you can't just have our citizens. They belong to us. They're our property. And 
countries agree to it and there's a process that you have to go through so these dual citizenships and these multi-citizenships in other countries if you take them and start to kind of fan them out i think that is the going to be the thrust of our resurgence because being in a place that was built completely on our backs and to our detriment there is a a a, a level of unreality that we exist in thinking that somehow we're going to end up on the top of this totem pole at some point it's not going to happen and i'm kind of okay with that because this ain't mine like whatever it is i'm okay not having to claim it for as much as me and my ancestors have contributed to it i'm okay with subsequently shifting this back or shifting the tide for us to go in a direction that is going to grow us that is going to allow us to be what we are. Because at the end of the day, this country doesn't fear our size and our physical prowess and anything like that. They're concerned that at some particular point, people are really going to lean into the idea that we're the first people. We're the first thing that God created when he started this. He's like, oh, wow, here we go. And if we ever figure that out, it'll be like, we'd be able to, what did the um the people on on Star Trek used to do, they'd stand in that thing and it'd take them from one place to another, like they had a term for it. But we'd literally be able to shift from place to place like that as soon as we figure out our greatness. And I think that is, I think a part of that is us linking, making these links and tying each other together so we understand. Because just knowing you guys, I'd come to Japan just to hang the hell out because I'd probably walk down the street and be like, wow, they don't have a such and such. And I'd be, paid, I'd be prepared to jump on it if one of you guys are going to be my link there for us to make that happen. Yeah, beam me up. Somebody just put it in the chat. Yeah, they used to beam up. It's like you'd be on the, you'd be on the Star Trek and the next minute you're on Mars. And if you're Captain Kirk, you'd be on Mars with, with a green girl and uh, so on and so forth. But well, that's, Alex, that's, that's I appreciate uh, you. I appreciate you guys. So Alex, need to, we, these guys need to let you know your information is the next time you're in Japan. You'll hook up with Alex and Renzo. Um, Charles, thanks, Kendrick. No problem. Charles? Yes, I'm sorry for the light. My phone's about to die. I was getting a little panicked. Um, here's my, look, I, as a Nietzschean Buddhist myself, that's really my only connection to Japan. Um, but to Kendrick's point about, and to, and to I forgot his name. The, the young man, the young man who talked about when 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 people of color see each other, I see you, and there's Alex. just a yeah, Alex, but there's just a subtle acknowledgement without a big show that uh, you know I see you. Um, when I go around the world, that's kind of not my experience, which leads to my question. When I go around the world, Iceland, Oslo, wherever, and I try to, you know, I'm a very social person. I interact with, I interact with people and I'm drawn to people and people are drawn to me because in many instances, I'm, I'm sure this is Kendrick's experience and, and definitely the two men who are sharing their experiences in Japan, you know, we're very used to being the only black person, the only black male person in a crowd. Here's my question. Um, sometimes, you, sometimes there's no acknowledgement. Uh, in fact, there's the antithesis of an acknowledgement when um, th this is my experience when you're in different parts of the world and they find they see that you're black, but when they find out that you're black American, there's a different reaction. So here's my question uh, to the to the two presenters. When you when you're based on your experience in Japan, is there an awareness of or is there an awareness or a, or a different experience? If you're Black American, and I, what I'm, and you, when I'm, let me make my question clear. In America, we know that there's a nuance to being Black. If you're, if you're, if you're Afro-Caribbean, if you're Afro-Hispanic, uh, it's a little bit, you get a little bit extra little something here in the United States. But if, but if you're just regular Black American, you're not Caribbean, you're not Latino, you're not biracial you're just regular black american my question is 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 
is the idea of you being a black person that nuanced in Japan? And if so, how is that nuance manifest? And if it isn't, why do you think that there isn't that nuance? Does that, does my question clear? Yeah. It, okay. ma it makes sense. Um, well, I'm Jamaican, right? And right. Um, I've interviewed, uh, as I said, over 200 people, um, Japanese people as well, uh, people from all over Asia. And I did, I asked, well, I was asking a Japanese man, he's maybe like in his early 30s, this question about black people. And there was a different, in terms of the perception, as you said, if someone is from Africa, uh, there's a certain perception that they have of that individual based on, of course, media, the culprit, the eternal culprit. Um, they, fe they feel that, of course, they're impoverished, they're scary, they're all these things. But on the flip side, if a person is um, African-American or Black American, they there's a different response to it because of course um like they think about the music and they think about like all the cool stuff right so that particular individual he had a really high view of black americans right because of you know it's america the weight of the country as well right what america represents in the world um mm -hmm. they're american um and then after so the africans the, in their view and not just him as well like other um japanese people have the same thing where they feel like because they're african you know you're impoverished and all these things and you're coming from a place where you're coming to take from japan versus mm -hmm. contributing to japan and if you're an Amer african american you're coming from a country that's already thriving mm -hmm. right africa is a continent of course mm -hmm. we're coming from a country that's mm -hmm. thriving so you're not necessarily coming here to really mm -hmm. take from the country that's not the immediate perception right Understood. and most people in japan overall uh that come here are educated right it's not you don't really find many people in japan who are just here just walking around do nothing right professionals mostly professionals um are in japan that to come here it's really hard so so that's my my understanding from people i've spoken to african-americans say the same thing as well there's a different level of treatment that they get and some africans have told me that they've gotten negative treatments but you got the flip side as well so it's but yes there is a nuance um some uh some people have actually shared that with me. That's interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. So um, does anyone have any um, well, questions for Renzo? Um, I kind of like forced Alex to come on. He didn't want to come on, but I said, Alex, come on. You got to come on. We're talking about Japan. Hey, come on. But um, Renzo, we can't thank you enough for your time and for you know, just informing us and like Kendrick is saying, just giving us such a healthy perspective of something other than where we are, you know, and um, everywhere we go, there'll be challenges, but um, I think it's just great to be informed and to hear a different perspective of a different place. So um, does anyone have anything else as we wind down? I think Alex, Alex wanted to just have one question. Alex, go ahead, Alex. Alex is long-winded also, so that's why. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I, there's so many questions, things to unpack. If you guys are interested in, I mean, obviously, there's so much content on Renzo's page. Um, if you want to hear more about my own personal story, I have a documentary uh, that came out this year. If you are interested in it, please uh, just contact me personally. Uh, I'm going to list my email address as well as uh, my website where you can kind of uh, see my work, see the trailer for my documentary, all of that, all that information um, where I, I do talk about, you know, being black in Japan. What is the idea of, um, you know, being American in Japan? What types of representation do you have as an American in Japan? All of those things. So, um so Alex, can you yeah. share all that in the chat? And, yeah, and yeah, 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 yeah. And Alex, Alex, we're gonna give you your own platform and we're gonna invite you to come and give from an American perspective. That would be great. Someone yeah. from Queens, right? Or Brooklyn. Yes, Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Brooklyn for the death of me, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uncle Mike, Uncle Mike, please don't mix up Brooklyn, baby. Brooklyn is Brooklyn, okay? Brooklyn. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, so, any other any other questions for Renzo? Ranjo, I do have a question for you, Ranjo. Um, the question we wanted to know was your, any concerns for your daughter? And you talked about her safety, which I totally get. Um, I'm just wondering, because this was a concern I had for my daughter here in the States. 
that she knew her identity, that her, you know, her identity would be not confused by the environment that she was in um, as a black woman. Um, and part of that is I was very careful to make sure she was in community where she could see her auntie, she can see her grandma, she can, you know, actually experience the black, you know, she can see her, her mom. So do you ever have any concern about your, your daughter and her identity as a black woman? I know she has a mom, which is yeah, great. Like, um, that was something, the thing is, because I guess I'm a sort of researcher, journalist at heart. So for me, I like gathering data, right? So it's not just necessarily about just how I feel about something. So I interviewed people who've actually walked in my shoes before, right? So the children, like black girls, black boys who grew up in Japan, their parents try to find out their perspective, get as much data, and then I try to apply it to my own life. Um, so I did have some concerns about my daughter uh, in terms of identity. And the, the first thing she asked many years ago, I uh, mean, well, not many, but maybe like, I don't know, maybe three years ago, there about, um, was like, why is she black? Like, why is here black and here is white? And um, ask questions, why, um, why isn't Japanese her first language? And why, you know, stuff like that. And we have to explain that. And um, she does contact like her grandparents in the States and Canada. Um, and she regularly, actually, almost every week, pretty much every week, she's always talking to them, uh, family members who are black. So she's very well connected, virtual with that side of the, um, her family, right, both sides. Uh, so I think she, there's no confusion with that. Um, anything that she brought up was maybe a while back that we addressed it. And I keep trying to reinforce these things. She knows what I do, you know, the work I've done. She watches my videos and stuff. She, we buy books about just, you know, the black experience and different things. And she's always reading that. So she has an understanding. And I think it was also from a book she read where that was a sort of like uh, the impetus for her writing a letter because it was after she read that book, I guess she felt something was in that book that <laughs> um, impelled her uh, to write this letter uh, to present her to her teacher. So right now it seems fine. Um, she's a really amazing mother, and she's connected, well connected to her, you know, Jamaican side, Canadian side, you know, those in America as well. And so I think, in terms of it's COVID time, so I wanted to go and visit physically because she hasn't seen my parents since she was like a few months old, right? Uh, but COVID tra uh, traveling right now is just too hectic. But I want to bring her, you know, maybe every summer or something, so she can actually, you know, get to know that side as well. But so far, so good, thank God. Yeah, I can see you're very intentional. And, you know, just being incredible parents, I, I can see that's taken care of, which is great. Yeah, that's great. I appreciate it. Yeah, you, you, you're doing amazing work, you know, you're educating us and we really appreciate you. And I've been watching some of your, your um, interviews. That's why I knew um, Big Jerk. And- um, Okay, okay. <laughs> and um, it's, it's, it's really, amazing the work that you're doing. So keep up the good work. Anyone have any last words they want to say or questions for um, Renzo? I actually uh, had a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, it ahead, lends man. to what you said, Uncle Mike, um, and Ranzo, you saying that your main concern is your daughter, protecting your daughter, and just still uh, giving her the identity of her identity, right, of being Black. Um, however, you know, I don't know how, how do you feel about maintaining though that um struck that black structure the, the structure of the black family right because hearing the percentage of, of blacks that are in japan um uh, and there's no doubt that your daughter now is six and depending on and this is assuming that everything goes well in japan you stay there um because of the limited um amount of us there um she will eventually you know where I'm getting to this. So you eventually bring someone yeah. home to you. And so do you have any reservations on, on that? Well, what are your thoughts about that? I guess, I guess that's a real question. Um, that's a real question. And it's a question I tried to just, it has popped up in my mind and I tried to just, you know, just ignore it. I'm like, you know, what? I'm not even entertaining the idea of um, that relationship part right now. I'm like, you know, what? let's just enjoy my daughter's childhood. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, uh, yeah, who knows? Who knows? Yeah, that's a very uh, delicate question. Um, but um, hey, hopefully someone like your father, right? But who knows, right? We don't, we don't know what the future holds, right? So um, 
I'll wait for that time and, and take it slowly and make sure I give my daughter all the tools she needs. And hopefully once she come up, you know, she's at, you know, 18, 20, whatever, she can decide. Um, and she has all the tools to make the right decision um, in all areas of her life. And, uh, you know, choose wisely. Someone amazing, you know, someone that will respect you and all these things, right? So that's that's my hope, right? I'm, I'm praying, I'm praying. All right. <laughs> Good question. I, 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 another question. Renzo, I want to thank you for jumping on with us. I really appreciate it, man. Even though, what is it, like nine, almost 9.30 <laughs> where you're at right now. And I know you got a lot of things to do. Um, just the brothers, just subscribe to his YouTube channel. You know, show him love. Um, also, Renzo, you know, you have a... Did this freeze? This I don't know. Yeah, he froze. Yeah, he's frozen. So, Renzo, it's said, you know, you have a platform here. So we're here as well. So anytime you want to come on and share anything that you're doing, you know, feel welcome. It's the same link, the same link that you have. That's the link we use every Thursday. Froze. Definitely feel, you know, welcome to just come in and just let us know what you're doing and share. Um, this is your platform as well. And I just subscribed to your channel, brother. I appreciate it. Guys, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, honestly, I'm watching the time because I should have actually been somewhere else oh, wow. at nine o'clock <laughs> um, um but um but yeah it, it's cool but because of this is something very important in terms of talking about you know like black fathers i'm super passionate about it and of course as i said there are a lot of black men in japan who i know one that's actually in jail believe it or not um because he was trying to contact his daughter um and that's another thing i'm trying to like work on as well so there's a lot of like crazy stuff there's another like flip side that is 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 very uh insidious um like stories that you would not believe are real life stories um so yeah that's another part of it as well but um but yeah guys it's it's very important and thanks for having me i'll drop, drop my email and my social if you guys want to like contact reach out thank um, you but i appreciate it yes, thank, you, man. Thanks thanks a lot. thank you man thank you thank you we appreciate all right, you. All right take care man you dropped it already right, is it in there yeah 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 it's there, it's there. thank you got it thanks thanks again Renzo. all right take care Right. Take care, guys. Okay. Alex, um, we're gonna have you on another evening so you could give us the Brooklyn, <laughs> Brooklyn to Japan experience. Yeah. <laughs> Brooklyn to Japan. I got it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, you you kind of got lucky today because um, I took the day off, but uh, yeah, because it's Friday morning here, and normally I would be you know at work teaching and. Um, but yeah, the next time I have a Friday morning off, I'll, I'll let you know. Please, please nice. do. Alex, yeah, thank, thank, man. Man. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you, guys. You're so welcome. Well. Thank you. Thank, thank you for sharing. We appreciate you. Good All to right, see you, everybody. brothers. All right, thank everybody. You. All right, fellas. Have a great have evening. Good night, guys. Peace. All right. Have a great evening, fellas. All right, good night. Peace. Bye, guys.